Our second podcast about covalent bonding has to do with both the strength and the length of bonds that can form. <clears throat> so the strength of the covalent bond depends upon how far apart the nuclei are of the two bonding atoms. And what we have, first of all, is a definition. The distance between two bonding nuclei at their position of maximum attraction is called the bond length. Let's take a look at a bit more graphics on that. So you can see that the bigger and fatter that the atoms get, the greater the distance between their two nuclei. So actually what you're seeing here are a bunch of halogens. Iodine, this one correctly pictured in purple here, is the biggest individual atom, so it's harder for them to get closer to another big fat individual iodine ion or atom. So that length between them is the longest of the set. So size of the atom in one way can determine how close a bonding atom can get to another <clears throat> and therefore determine its bond length. Now let's take a look at these guys and I think if you stare at it long enough you're going to see something pop out at you. First of all, there's that symbol we learned back when we studied the electron, the angstrom. So we're talking tiny, tiny distances. Remember there were 10 to the 10th angstroms per meter. But the easiest way to see this is to look at trends. So here's a single, double, and triple bonded carbon atom, and look what's happening to the length of the bond. It's getting smaller. The same trend can be seen here as they go from single to double to triple in nitrogen. And that makes sense. If you have a triple bond, it's kind of like you're snugged in closer and tighter and more strongly, and the length of the bond gets shorter. We'll pick, up, we'll pick up on this video here next time I see you guys in class. I don't want to take time to do um, those in the podcast. But let's look at the understanding now that that bond link that we just talked about is actually more like a spring. It's not this rigid distance that can only be one set value. Sometimes it might expand, sometimes it might contract. And so what two atoms do is they find like Goldilocks did after she broke and entered into the bear's house. She was finding things that were too small or too large or too hot until she found something that was just right. So atoms can be, in this particular case, two hydrogen atoms. They're too far apart from each other, so they don't bond. And if you get too close to each other, the repulsive forces are too strong so that you can't make a bond either. What this graph is showing on the horizontal axis is the length of the bond itself. And this represents the energy. Energy is always trapped in bonds of chemical compounds. Remember, the universe likes to go to a lower energy state. So if they're too close to each other over here, you can see you'd be high energy. But if they're too far apart from each other, then there's not enough attractive force. Now here they're starting to bond, but notice that if they get to the just right distance, which happens to be 0.74 angstroms, that's the optimum distance for two hydrogen atoms to form a stable bond. Now the strength of the bond is also something that we can measure. The length of the bond is determined by how big the atoms are and the number of electron pairs that they share. The greater the number of multiple bonds, then the shorter the bond length. But if you look at these three molecules right here, you have to know how to draw Lewis structures to be able to figure out fluorine has a single bond, oxygen has a double, and nitrogen has a triple. So as we try to logic out on a test question, who would have the greatest bond length? It's the one with the fewest number of bonds. It would be, in this particular case, the fluorine. Notice this chart shows the average bond enthalpy in kilojoules per mole. Notice that the definitions say that this bond dissociation energy, what it takes to split apart a bond, is the energy required to break a specific covalent bond. But you can actually interpret this chart in a couple ways. Bonds, when they form, release energy. Bonds, when they break, require energy. So it's not exactly correct to say that 
The bond enthalpy is the energy required to break the bond. It's also the energy released when the new bonds form. And the way that we change that value is we put a negative sign in front of the bond enthalpy to indicate that as a bond forms, it releases energy out into the system that surrounds that particular, or the surroundings that surrounds that particular system. So once again, you should notice a trend. Above the line are all of the singly bonded atoms. And notice that if you pick bonds that are between two atoms that are the same, here is a carbon-carbon single bond. It would take 348 kilojoules to break that. But if you make it a double bond, it almost doubles the energy required to break it. And if you make a triple bond out of those two carbon, it requires even more. Again, remember, another way to think of it is that's the energy that could be released when those bonds form. So having more and more multiple bonds makes your bond stronger and your bond enthalpy higher. So when you compare those, here is our conclusion. The more multiple bonds that are in a molecule between two similar atoms, the more energy it takes to break the bond or the more energy would be released if the bond is forming. So if we go back to this question, now again you would have to be able to know how to draw Lewis structures which we're currently practicing. Fluorine single, oxygen double, nitrogen triple. Which do you think is the molecule that has the greatest bond strength? And of course you'd be right if you picked nitrogen with its triple bond. Now when a chemical reaction occurs, we have to take reactants bonds and break them, then we shuffle the parts around, and we form new bonds when the products begin to be created. So when you form a bond, that releases energy. Now we already have defined what is exothermic and endothermic, but let's go ahead and redefine them again. Remember, exo means you're releasing heat to the surroundings around the system that you're taking under consideration. That's why it feels hot. We'll show you with a graphic here how that can occur. And an endothermic reaction will feel cold because it requires a net absorption of energy. So it's going to need more energy to break the bonds than is released when new bonds form. Let's look at a graphic of that specifically. So if you interpret this diagram, Enthalpy stands for heat or heat content. Another way to think of it is chemical compounds keep heat trapped in their bonds. So if this methane wants to join up with some chlorine, this is the starting point. Over here is the final product, methyl chloride and hydrogen chloride. So you can see that we're going to break apart the chlorine and break off a hydrogen. And this is how much energy it requires to do so. Enthalpy is another way to measure energy. So now temporarily, oh, also you have to break apart two chlorine atoms. This requires energy to break off that hydrogen and to break up those two chlorines. So temporarily they all kind of stand there looking at each other for a nanosecond, and then they decide to go back to being stable again. One chlorine will jump on top of the CH3 group, and an H and a Cl will get together. Here are the two products again, methyl chloride, and hydrogen chloride. This time, the red line represents the energy released when bonds form. So we have bond breaking, we have bond forming. What's the net result here? Your choices are you're going to have to pick exo or endothermic. And the way you answer these questions is, if it releases more energy when bonds form than it took to break them in the first place, you got yourself an exothermic reaction. So I'm hoping you circled the correct answer exothermic. If this had been endothermic, that situation would have been reversed. More energy would have been required to break the bonds than what was released when new bonds form. That concludes our very short podcast on bond energy, bond length, and bond strength. See you next time.